Hello, welcome. <laughs> Were you, what did you end up doing? Seriously. You did? It worked? Yes. Oh my goodness. I'm going to set this up all. Sorry, it's a little nervous. Okay. Oh, broken. Broken one. Oh, they won't remove this chair, Celia. 
I think, oh, wait, maybe this is just the broken desk and not the broken chair. Oh, dude. They're all so bad. Huh. I'm so scared that soon as everything going on. Every day I put a new kid up and say, chair is broken with a sign on it. <laughs> Oh, that should work. I don't bring you a water bottle. Oh, no, no, no. I don't bring any. And I haven't I don't know where I would. Um, you don't need any technology. You're just going to talk. Nothing. Okay. All right. I'll just say, like, do you have a preference for a chair? Because there's also this could be lower. Oh, this is also a lower. Yeah, this is so fun. <laughs> okay. I tried to erase it, but it was the class that was in here before. There. I, does anyone know what this language is? It's French? I don't think so. It's not French. Oh, remember? No, no, not French. I'm wondering. Yeah, maybe. I, I actually can ask her sometime if she's leaving here because I know French, but I know. Like, I wouldn't even know how to. I, yeah, I thought maybe Greek or something like close to Greek. It would have that. Right, right. It doesn't have that. So it can't yeah. be that. So maybe you're right. Do is pin mine. Hey, I, I think you're spotting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, how many students will be here today? That's a different question. We have a lot of people. We have 16 or 17 students in the class, but I you know uh, I have one or two students going online, and then we've had some like, people that. <laughs> we discussed how the cold weather was maybe encouraging at that time. I'm getting glad I'm on the Going to get even colder. Oh, the snow. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know I didn't take your email. Yeah, but yeah, it looks like I didn't see anything from me. Um, and as for the protection, it's really fine. Oh, 
so clearing house works with lots of school and then the one the trainings, the business the cultivations, and Wait, so wait, in your church, they don't call you Reverend Doctor, or they do? No, I do not start it. We may have some people coming in. So I will kind of close the door, but please. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited today. We have Reverend Dr. Steve Brawley with us. Um, Sue is going to talk to you about, well, whatever really Sue wants to talk about, but it will be on the subject of <laughs> butch identity and life um, and certainly draw on Sue's personal experience. We're really grateful for you being here. And uh, in general, we like to engage. So feel free to ask us questions and, and just kind of do whatever you'd like to do. I'm going to go and sneak in the back. Okay. So I told the professor, you know, yeah, she can use all the different angles. I'm like, well, you can just call me Sue. I'm not going to go by most days. So let me tell you a little story to start. I'm not going to do any whole things. Wow. Mm -hmm. You're not a school Um, Let me tell you a little bit about me, just about how I grew up, because I know you've been reading. You read uh, Boots, Brothers, Circles of Gold. You read um, Stone, Witch Blues. I know you're reading other components, and I've given you different timelines. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my timeline. Uh, so I'm hoping to do a short of sort of living history. Um, Buffalo's LGBTQ. Of course, I was growing up with really just G and sometimes L. Uh, I didn't always acknowledge the L. And nobody talked about P or T or Q or anything else. So uh, we put those things in P very respectfully. So I was born a gay child in 1959. Totally true. I was born to a lesbian. Believe it or not, I'll tell you that story later. And uh, I was the product of a horrific rape. And she gave me up for adoption at birth. So I spent three months being raised by lesbian nuns 
in an orphanage. They were the most wonderful women in the world, at least my parents tell me that. They would always try to put little bows in my hair and it would never happen. It wouldn't take the bows, it wouldn't take the ribbons. My hair just shot straight out of my head. Joke at family is it's the straightest thing about me. <laughs> and it's still true today. They kind of slipped it up for you. So I was adopted into an Irish Catholic family from South Buffalo. Or anything from this area you know what that means? Okay, so basically it means that the Bible was the rule and every meal was a meat, a potato, and a grudging vegetable. And God ruled everything. And being Irish and being Catholic, there really wasn't a lot of delineation between the two. And my family was sort of off the boat, meaning uh, my grandparents came from Ireland as well. And when they came here, they really just wanted to be Americans. They, they didn't have sort of that Irish pride that some people have when they go back to roots. It was all about be American and be in America. So it was about finding your way. And of course, within the Catholic tradition. So we had teachers, we had nurses, and we had a lot of cops. That was my growing up. Lots of civil servants. And of course, everything was about beauty. Hi, we're all saying our names, our passwords for our uh, bank accounts. Oh, I don't even know my password. I'm in my face. So I was just telling them all about me. I'm Donald Trump's second cousin. <laughs> <laughs> so growing up, there was some expectations about what you're supposed to be. And for my world, it was going to be one of two things. I was either going to be a teacher or I was going to be a cop. That's sort of how my family kind of looked at things. I didn't know what I wanted to be. You know, it was the 60s, really primarily growing up, little girl, but really I liked all the things boys like. And of course, then you get the nickname Tomboy, because if you like to play sports and you like to play rough and you like to get dirty and go outside. And that didn't always sit too well. My mother didn't quite know what to do. She prayed a lot, you know, spent a lot of time in the place. <laughs> no. And so life was really always a balance of how to be an authentic person and how to play within the prescriptions of what life was. So I went to this Catholic school in West Seneca. That's primarily where I grew up was West Seneca, New York. And on the playground, which was also the parking lot for Sunday services and all the rest, there was this big white line that was painted right down the middle of the parking lot. And at recess, that line told where the boys played and where the girls played. And on the girls' side, there was double dutch and some kind of marbly thing. And I have no other idea because I didn't want anything to do with anything. I wanted to be on the boys' side because that's where the basketball rims were or the volleyball or anything else that was fun to be played. And I often crossed that line, much to the chagrin of my parents, who then, of course, I got hauled into the principal of not too kindly old nun with a ruler that I still have marks from on my knuckles. And of course, they'd say, Mrs. Frawley, what are we going to do about her? And my mother would just do this thing. And I'm like, let me play. And I was, you know, dying to sing inside my head. But let me just go over there and let me play. Because after school, when school was over, nobody cared who was on which side. Hi, welcome. Hi. You know, it costs five dollars to be in class today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go outside every row. Now you've already done everything. You did sweat equity, and you're asked. So um, after school, you could play wherever you wanted. Which always amazed me that during the day I couldn't play there. But after school, I could play to my heart's content. I could be on the basketball courts, I could be in the kickball, and of course, all my own as well. And that was pretty much life. And I thought I was kind of destined to it. In eighth grade, it was the big deal. You got to be a cheerleader if you wanted. And every girl in the elementary school was a cheerleader. Lovely little felt blue god awful body you know, I don't know, little boxy little thing with a little white turtleneck cheered for the boys. And I said, there is no, I didn't say there was no way in hell because we don't want to say hell or swear or anything else. But I just said no. And my mother was furious. What do you mean? You're gonna be the only girl in eighth grade who's not a cheerleader. Yeah. I go, I go and watch the games. I, you know, cheer for the game, you know, clapping as but no way that I want to be one of those blue cheerleaders. I'm going to date a couple of blue cheerleaders. And did it later in high school, but that's a different story. But I wanted to play. And luckily for me, in that year when I left eighth grade, there was a wonderful federal law called Title IX, which went forward. Because some of you, you may be in programs or activities or things that years ago you wouldn't have been able to be in. But because of Title IX, it opened up the doors for women, for minorities, for all kinds of otherwise underrepresented individuals to have fairness and equity in their ability to participate. So I got to high school 
Woohoo! There was girls' sports. There were activities that girls could be in. It was fantastic. I went to school early, and my mother never knew when I was coming home because there was intramurals. There were also teams to play on, all kinds of things. But there was one thing I really, really wanted to do. Um, I was captivated. I always liked theater. I've taken theater classes, um, but it wasn't pretty. It had to be pretty. And so I always was doing like building the scenes and doing basic lighting and all the rest. And when I got to high school, they had a stage crew. Oh boy. And I wanted to be in it and I wanted to learn how to do sound and lighting. Problem was, you had to be in the audio visual club. And girls were not allowed in the audio visual mm -hmm. club. As I learned, it was run by this old gay man. He just wanted the boys in there with them. And that's a whole other story as well. We'll talk about that. But I had this amazing teacher. I always named the good people. And her name was Catherine Mazza. And now it's Catherine Chester. She's our local actor. She never knew her somewhere. But this woman, she knew that I wanted to be there. She knew about this new law. And she went to the Board of Education. I didn't learn about this class after I graduated. And said, I have a girl who wants to be in this club. And federal law says she has a right to be there. And she wants to be part of this team with the stage crew. And there was a little bit of mumbling, but they knew they had to do it. And sure enough, like a week or two later, she came and said, Sue, after school, if you'd like to come and be part of this. And tomorrow morning, you report to Mr. Banks, because you're now in the AD club. <laughs> it was amazing. And of course, I was the only girl. And Mr. Banks let me know right away that this was not a place for everyone to be coming to do dating. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and you know, again, my identity of who I was and what I was really was. I mean, it's the 70s. Nobody was talking about gay people. You know, if anything, it was the hush you know, Auntie so and so or Uncle so and so who lives with somebody, but nobody talks about it. So nobody talked about that stuff. But anyway, it's like I wasn't there to be dating. I really I wanted to learn. And he figured it out right away. I mean, you know, he taught me all the machines. I learned so many skills and I loved it. I learned how to run a soundboard. I learned how to do electrical lights. I learned how to do a lot of videotaping, which led to some jobs because we used to do a lot of videotaping for the athletic teams. And we used to do stuff for different programs where we'd go in and we'd do the material and we'd do the slight. It was wonderful. I loved it. I loved it. Um, and once Mr. Banks saw that girls could be in there and not just be there to date all the boys that he had in there, little by little, some other girls came along. And by the time I was a senior and president of the audio visual club, thank you for joining me. They got to understand these guys too. A lot of them were there, but they were also going to the BOCES program. They were studying electronics, so they were studying other technology. Even today, like when I watch Channel 4 News, a lot of these gentlemen that I was with, they're some of the big tech and other guys. That's what they were headed for. And that's why they were in the club as well. And so it was really cool that as a senior, they voted me to be their president. And we had about four or five girls who were also part of the club. But that was like probably one of the first big, as opposed to going over the white line, steps in looking at gender equity and gender inclusion. Well, in the meantime, I was playing sports. I was loving it. And I was loving girls. And that was not allowed. You know, the Bible, Adam and Eve, there's no, you know, even, I don't know who else, but my mom and Steve, you make up your own name, whatever works. <laughs> and of course, this was sort of an issue in a, in a phase, I don't know, too, a, um, a problem for parents. They always thought it was a phase. One thing to know about Irish Catholic parents, and that's probably some other, you can tell them who you are, but then they forget, and you have to keep telling them constantly, you know, <laughs> like, you know, oh, by the way, I'm gay, and here's my girlfriend. And then they don't see you with anybody, and they think, oh, that went away, it's gone, <laughs> so there's somebody else. And it's like, but I thought that went away. No. It's, yeah, it's, it's just constant. Anyway, um, so that became one of the issues, too, and I became more aware of it. But in the 70s, there was no representation. There was no help. There was no anything. In fact, if anything, it was still treated like a mental illness. My mother wanted me to talk to a counselor, or maybe a friend. Maybe they can help. Maybe the sister never had a condom. I don't know this one. Um, so dashing through the sports was a place usually to find some other like-minded individuals, but it still was a place of great repression. All my coaches were gay, I would find that out later in life, but they did a lot to make sure that no one ever acted gay. You know, always act like a lady. When we were going to games, dressed like a lady, dressed like a lady, but I wanted my t shirts and my jeans. And above all, make sure that you represent properly. So at the same time, as I was in high school and all this was going on, there was a group, a group called Wang. It wasn't like Wang Chun or anything like that. 
when we are not gay. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole group <laughs> of athletes that joined this club. I did not, I didn't know, but I think they didn't purposely didn't invite me because they didn't. But, mm -hmm. but the funniest joke about it is most of the people who were in this club actually later in life, I would discover they were gay. Yeah, or queer, whatever word worked. But back in the 70s, gay was the word that was used. So if I'm using terminology, understand I'm using it in a time. And this group, if they thought anybody was gay, oh, they made sure that you were not welcome places. So if you were eating at a lunch table, so my senior year, um, things went on fine, but there was a camping trip where a lot of people had gotten drunk, and this one girl decided to kiss me on the trip, and some other people didn't like that. And by the time we got back to school, we're in lunch. And I'll never forget because I always say names of people are guilty. Lisa Ann Wynn sitting at lunch. I sit down and she takes the table and literally flips and says, No gay lords are going to sit at my table. No. Everybody else's jaws are. Like, and nobody knows what's going to happen. But the reality is, I mean, I was ready to fight this. But I was like, oh, this is <laughs> <laughs> a big fight. And I talk big, but I can also talk myself out of fights. So I never really had to physically prove what I could, couldn't do. But I had enough girth that it, you know, I usually didn't get messed with. But on this particular day, we say I wouldn't decide gay lord. That was the word. And of course, there was a scramble. Everything's happening. Everyone's talking. No one's going up. And this woman, and her name was Mrs. O'Brien, literally grabs me and takes me out into the hallway. And there's a ramp near where the ca uh, cafeterias were. And just walks me down. She says, just go. Just go and come back after the period. Okay. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm gonna see a principal coming and grabbing me and you know, the world's about to end, everything's bad. Nothing. Next period I went to my next class. Nothing. Nobody talked. There were no teachers that saw anything. Mrs. O'Brien just told people that the, the table had flipped over. At least Anne didn't want to get in trouble because then we were athletes. They got in trouble, we couldn't go. And everything just sort of went away. There were always murmurs. What I would find out later is that Mrs. O'Brien had a gay daughter. And when she saw and heard what was happening, she immediately just made sure that the whole situation was neutralized. So there are good allies. Even back in the 70s, they existed. They just didn't talk about it. So, graduated high school, luckily, without being harmed by Lisa Ann Wynn and all the rest. And when I was in college, I discovered a wonderful section of the library, the HQ section. Mm -hmm. Your professor, this was the only section of the library that had gay books. Of course, they weren't very happy gay books. Every lesbian died or was killed by, you know, groups of people. You know, love was something to be surrendered to and then death. Um, but it was representation, which is kind of sad because there was a joke long ago that lesbians would watch anything on TV as long as there would be lesbians or a kiss, no matter what happened, just because they wanted representation. Um, are you familiar with the comedian Leah Delaria? Have you studied her? Okay, well, go on YouTube, you'll find her. Uh, Leah's a uh, very old witch darling, and she makes a lot of these jokes about this, or just about that aspect of representation, and just about how people would watch anything just to see two women, because it didn't exist. We didn't have what is today. You know, Showtime, there's L word, represent, I'm trying to even think of all the different shows. You know more than I do, but there's so many shows, and sometimes it's just infused in, and nobody thinks twice about it. But back then, there was always an explanation or a cover, or presence, but no sexuality in the person. God forbid they'd be having sex. So, you know, we'll love you if you're gay, but not having sex. So this was college, and college just expanded that. And of course, I don't know, well, let me skip over part. It's just, it was a wonderful time. <laughs> it was a wonderful time to play sports. There was a lot of gay women who played sports. There wasn't the same stuff from high school as well, but also just in the academic components. It was like an expansion of vision. It was interesting when I was in high school, uh, Mrs. Trousseau, because again, I was in the guilty. When I was saying, what should, what should I do? She's like, well, you know, there's a box factory on Line Road. It's going to be firing. What do you think? No, I went to college. I'm the first person in generations to go to college in my family. But she didn't see me in that context. She just saw this jockey, biggest woman, you know, didn't really think about my academic skills. So I didn't listen to her. I went to Hilbert College. And I played every sport there, studied human services. Then I went to St. John Fisher after that, played soccer. That was when we first had a Division III school. Studied psychology, sociology, and communications. And then from there, I worked, and in between, I always worked, but I worked uh, uh, for a uh, runaway shelter. And there I really saw, I'm going to my master's degree. You know, I knew I wanted to do counseling. And I did. I went to Brockport, 
Um, the best counseling programs around outside of Syracuse or Penn State, if you're ever thinking about going into that. Um, and after that, took off. I counseled in all places. Mostly it was school counseling. I didn't even know I wanted to do that at the time, but it just seemed like a good space to go into. But I also did personal counseling, private counseling, counseling for agencies. Did that for almost 30 years, retired, uh, was a school administrator. Um, although no matter what I did, I like on the home people say, oh, are you the phys ed teacher? <laughs> now, I'm not making fun of phys ed teachers. Don't misunderstand that. I just, it was people's impressions or ideas. Like if you look a certain way, you must be a certain something. I'm like, God, I'm proud to be a phys ed teacher, but no, I am the assistant supervisor for people services. <laughs> I've seen. And I think that was part of it is that, that if you were a very visible butch woman, you were put in a different category of what your academic or professional opportunities could or might be. And that's a place for a long time. I was denied different jobs, denied different opportunities. I wasn't actually allowed to advance in some ways, but I stuck with that. And of course, as time went on, I got married. And when I got married, it was not a time when New York State was validating marriage. I had gotten a Canadian license. And so I wanted to get health care for my wife. Well, you could do that. It took a little working and uh, working with some different agencies. But because the feds didn't recognize it, I had to pay taxes on that. And at that time, there was just a couple other uh, gay married individuals who also were doing that. And the first time we got our paycheck and saw this, like, what is this? Because as an employee, I got free health care. So why am I being charged out of each bucket of my paycheck? And that was why. But luckily, we had a governor, Governor Patterson, who in New York State, he affirmed gay marriage. And eventually, that also allowed for the balance to say, yep, yeah, and you know what? If you're getting benefits, you're not going to get charged that way. So that's just a little bit of a part of the history. But in the meantime, we're all around this. There were things going on in the world. So I think the professor wanted to talk to you about sort of gay life in the 70s. And so when I was in high school, I didn't want to go to bars or anything. Um, I was 19 and 18, so I was in college. But when I was a junior in college, I had come home, my grandma had died, and some friends said, we're going to go out to a bar. And it was right around Halloween time. And this is 1980. So back then, there still were rules if you were in public, if you didn't have like, a certain number of, of uh, the gender that you were assigned to clothing upon you or dressing. But Halloween was the night that everything let loose. Now, never having gone to a gay bar, never knowing this, I go out to a place called Mean Alice's. If you don't know, the names of bars were hysterical. Usually they had a female name and something, you know, um, Uncle Betty's or something. I, I mean, every gay bar, if you look from the 70s, had names like that. It was hysterical. And Mean Alice's, the funny part about it, it doesn't exist anymore. It's the, the building is still on Main Street. It's near the theater district. Was that during the day, it was this wonderful luncheonette that many of the downtown businessmen, including my father, who was a banker, that they would walk to and have their lunch and maybe a little cocktail if they were doing it. And then by night, everything changed. Because back then too, nobody stayed downtown. Downtown would be deserted. And then suddenly, there was me and Alice's. And the thing about bars back then is bars were a sanctuary. When the Pulse nightclub shooting took place, they talked about that space as being a sacred, a cathedral type of space. But perhaps people today don't get it. But when you live in a very repressive community, a repressive society, or a repressive time, back in that time, a lot of us, that place was sacred. And there were rules. They weren't written down. They were sort of told or shared as time on about how you interacted with each other, how you would behave, and how you kept the sacredness. Especially if you see somebody in there, you don't tell other people about it. If somebody finds out you're talking, they're not going to let you back in the next time. You have to preserve that secret, not secretly, but the privacy and the sanctity. And it really was about that. Even though there were some characters, I walked in. So here's little Susie White, right from the suburbs, you know. Okay. And I say that in that way because I had no exposure to diversity. I had no exposure to anything except my little Catholic world. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> Drag queens, go go dancers. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. Um, and it was fun, but it was also Halloween. So everyone's also in these costumes. And it was just, it was like this imaginary crazy world. And I loved it. And of course, then when I would come home uh, on breaks from school, I'd go out with my friends and that became the center of space. And little by little, we found some other spaces. And if you heard a little bit about Buffalo, so when you read um, Stone Witch Blues, and they talked a little bit about the bars from the early, early parts. Um, 
Buffalo is an amazing bar history. In fact, if you ever go to a Bison's baseball game or you go to the Taste of Country, um, not that, but you're in that field, look in the far part of the center field, just out of the grass area. In 1935, that's where the first registered bar that actually was a gay bar in Buffalo was located. Right there. It was very quiet, very secret, very sacred. So when I go to the baseball games, I can say, I'm here to pay homage to my ancestors. Mm -hmm. But there weren't a lot of bars. Um, in fact, um, you may have read about or learned about Stonewall at the same time as also when things were happening in San Francisco. Those were the times of the beginning of the revolution, of the standing up of people asking for rights. And here in Buffalo, we had amazing people like Marilyn Davis and Carolyn Spesser. Um, oh, his name is right. Um, Lipton Hayes, I can't remember what the first name, who were out there, who they were part of different groups. Some of them were part of the Communist Socialist Group. Who were working a lot with unionization issues, and some of them were also part of democratic groups. And then at the same time, through that power, they were moving forward. Madeline Davis, who just died this past year, she was one of the first people to speak at a national convention, getting up as a representative to that convention to speak about gay rights. It had never happened before. And this is the late 60s going into the 70s. It was unheard of. And of course, her archives that are over at Buff State are amazing to go through because Madeline, being a librarian, she kept everything, everything, buttons and programs from, from shows and everything else, but it catalogs because nowhere was there a way to say, where is our history? Nobody was keeping it. And those things were important to know about. So, we're going to go off. I, I got off kind of it. Um, I'll go back to me now to the bar scene. Ah, the bar scene. So I talked about that. You know, if you go to center, there were there were all these undercover places. There was the hibachi club, which was mostly for men and for other men. They didn't really, and there was a real distinction between men and women. Uh, there weren't really women bars uh, at, the, at the beginning of that time. Actually, about a year later, another place opened. It was called Betty's, and it was run by the mafia because that's how things work. Oh, back to bars. So in 1969, when Governor Nelson Rockefeller came into New York. And he was going to clean everything up. He was going to get rid of all these, you know, places of immorality. And he knew that there was lots of payoffs that took off between the police, between mafia, between others. So he made a crackdown. That's part of what happened. He created Stonewall. That really was what occurred. There had been raids and things had gone on. But when Judy Garland passed away and everyone was in the barn mourning, and it really was a sacred time and the cops came in, people had just had it. And that combination of grieving and being preyed upon, that's what set that off as well. But it was still happening across the area, especially in Buffalo, big time. So any of the places that had bars completely shut down, their liquor licenses were pulled. So uh, juice bars started up because you didn't need a liquor license, there couldn't be as much. And that's also where groups would meet, like the Machine Society, where the early beginnings of the gay and lesbian network that would come later on. And then other bars started as well. So there was Betty's. Uh, which was over on Chippewa, which always had to take, because back then that was a really high crime area, shall we say. That uh, wasn't like the Allen Street or anywhere that you might uh, um, may go to today. Totally different space. Uh, and you took a lot of risks going there. There were people that were doing with cameras sometimes to get pictures. The police definitely did raid. Um, if you read um, Stonebridge Blues, and they talked about the red light. There were still red lights in the bars and police were coming in and it wasn't so much about not being with partners it was just letting people know especially if you were underage or something else um usually you knew hopefully where exits were to get out but sometimes the police figured that out too i was only in two raids ever where i had to show id nothing happened they just came in because they could and sometimes it was because either the owner hadn't paid to keep their protections up or whatever but it still was not cool eventually in time there was a bar called MC Confidence on Niagara Street. It was lesbian owned, lesbian run, and they would let gay men come in because at that time, some of the bars also, they didn't really want women to be in their bars. New analysis had plenty. Sometimes they wanted you there and sometimes they didn't. And the Bacha Club definitely sometimes didn't want people. And there were little other little neighborhood bars that people sold it was like speakeasies that you couldn't display. Uh, I can't even remember the names of them, it's so terrible. But Compton's opened up, and that was our place, and it was the place. It was as much a social club and a haven as anything else in this world. And still with the same rules about how to behave, how to be there. And there were three rules I remember. It's like, no matter what, you don't rest with somebody's job, with their family, or with their house. No matter what your beef is. It was interesting. And everybody seemed to know, like if you ask people from that time period. 
And I remember walking in and I was, I was very, very young. And Cheryl Cooper, the owner, she's still around. She still does a lot of community work, uh, but works as a teacher in Buffalo still. And we'd walk in and there was the bar at first and there'd always be these older women at the end. And a lot of them were factory workers or other just really hard life kind of workers, shall we say. And they'd sit at the end of the bar and they'd have their beers. And we walk in and also, you know, hipster little, but we were, we, we were more back during that time, even the butch identity wasn't really uh, embraced. So we were more jockish and sportos um, or socias. I believe those words make sense. So you'd have your little eyes out, sweaters and all the rest. And we'd look at these women and think, oh God, we don't want to be like them. Now, I'm not telling you those stories, but that's what we would think. We'd think, oh God, we don't want to be like them. Like we want to be like us. And how did they get that way? What's their story? And I'll tell you, there was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of alcoholism. Because to be in the bar for many people, first of all, that was a big deal. To be present and to be comfortable, for some people, took a lot of anesthesia. And along with it, I watched friends and people who I had known. And as they went, and of course, being there and these drinking, drink, and moving to that level. I was lucky. I didn't really like drinking. I did. Um, and then I actually had a little disease. I couldn't drink. And I still don't drink to this day. I don't want to drink. But I got to see things in a whole different way. And I also got to see those women at the end of the bar and I got to understand their lives. The joke is now my cohorts of people that I hung out with back then, and many of them are still know, we are those women. But we look a little different. We are a little different. We had opportunities that they didn't have. We had education opportunities. We've had employment opportunities. And we've had visibility opportunities that they didn't have. And I think that that's an important thing when I look historically back on that. But that bar was everything. Friday, Saturday, and sometimes on Sundays, if there was a game or something else going on, always there. My cover was that I was going out with my cousin Michelle. She was also there. And her cover to her mother wasn't going out with Susie. And they just thought we were somewhere in South Buffalo. Yes, Susie, that's what they called me back then. If you're from South Buffalo, you always had an IE. Except for the Sunday that my mother went to church and she saw my Aunt Marie. And of course, she said, Oh, Susie and Michelle had a good time last night. And my aunt said, What are you talking about? Marie's home, she's sick. <laughs> and so by the time my mom got home from church and it was family lunch, I was in deep shit. <laughs> Where have you been going? What are you doing? You've been telling me you're going out with Michelle, and that's not what you've done. And of course, I had to make up another lie because being being gay in the 70s and the 80s meant lying a lot. Lying to others, lying to yourself, just to survive. Now there's some that didn't, and you've read some of those books about people who they had that character, but they paid a lot of prices for that. And it was always a balance. But for me, that was the same thing. Do I be real? Do I not be real? How much do I share? Who do I share with? Changing, you know, pronouns. How huh? we took care of pronouns because if I was talking about a girl, uh, you know, and I'm talking on the phone with a friend, everything was like, oh, he, he, you know, always changing everything. So, you know, because back then there was only one phone that was on the court and went this way into the kitchen or, you know, there was no privacy. So if my mom's there, it's kind of like, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, oh, he's three. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He and I went for ice, you know. <laughs> So it was those components as well. Um, let me just check on. So I'm lucky. I was able to stand up, to be myself, to come to some aspect of understanding who I was. I actually didn't really understand I was butch until I was about 40 because I was really trying to figure it out. You know, we had, we, I was the sporty butch, I was the social butch. There weren't other examples of what was out there, but I used to it was something where I always loved wearing bow ties. I still do. I wear them every day at my job. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out how do I be me, but how do I also fit into where I want to be? And at that time, I was working as a school counselor and I was a school administrator. And it was always, always a challenge because there were some that were cool and there were many that were not. I took a lot of crap from different people. I worked in the city for many years, but I also worked hard. I was part of the group that got the proclamation that's part of the mission statement for Buffalo City Schools that said, we do not discriminate against. And that for that time, they said, we it took them longer than everything else. But that was a big deal. And then, of course, pushing for the equal uh, access to benefits and not having to have them be paid for, tax. That was a big deal. And it was always pushing and fighting against something that was about looking for rights. But that was that. And so, as I said, life went on. I was good. I had a nice professional job, got married, had two kids. I had a son who's in high school, a daughter who's in middle school. And um, that's about divorce. Why is that important? Well, because we talk so much about same-sex marriage rights. That was the phrase that was used. And why it was important. And all the 92 benefits you get by being married. And that are very important things. But what nobody talked about was what happens when same-sex individuals get divorced. 
and my ex-wife and I were one of the first groups to be part of where we got married. We had kids within that marriage, so it was different than people who had um, adopted their children. We got run through every single circuit because it was it was setting precedent, and they wanted to be very careful. It also was interesting because here I am, this butch woman, and my ex-wife, very femme, very feminine, you know, with a little pure little flower. And nobody wanted to believe some of the stories either about, you know, that little, you know, there was a lot of discrimination. Sometimes there were judges that would still call me sir. And I kick my attorney going, why are they doing this? She's like, just shut up because they can make your life worse. And I'm like, it's not fair. And partway through the divorce, I had started seminary, so I was able to wear my, my collar. And I started wearing that. And the other side tried to say that you were trying to be, I was trying to create an image. I'm like, yes, because if I go in as my authentic self, you've already got, a, you know, predetermination about who I am, what I am, and how things are, let's try and feel the way. And actually, things work out very fine. My, my kids are doing well. That's all that really matters in the divorce, because nobody ever wins. It's, you know, it, it's it's all just a damn war, sadly. And sometimes kids can be collateral, but my kids, they're healthy, they're good, and all is well. And that's really all that needs to be known about. Except that the courts still go through a lot of these things. There still isn't a good, you know, there's just not a good route. Um, many of my friends have had some real issues, especially my butch friends who were married to femmes, who had children. Um, they did not get the rights to see their kids all the time. Their rights were minimized or things were eliminated. Um, it was horrible. These things still exist. This past weekend, I went to dinner. Russell's, of course, right? Y'all know Russell, or maybe you see that. Okay. So Russell's is the big. Locally, um, Mr. Salvatore, who runs Russell's, oh, it's the place to go, you know, everybody wants to go to Russell's, it's like crib, and I wanted to go there, I wanted to go for a long time, sometimes birthday, so go there, oh, I was all excited, you know, because of the best steaks in the world, that's what they see through, and the cow came in, pretty nice and good on yours, and at some point I had to go to the bathroom, and at this point I really don't think about those things as much. So I walked down and I, I asked one of the people, you know, where's the restroom? And they pointed it out to me and I walked down. And as soon as I walked in, these ladies were walking out and they did this, oh! And I just sort of pushed past them, thinking, what the hell? Of course, I did. I had a tie on, I had a shirt, I had the jacket. But I know who I am and I know where to go to the bathroom, people. It's like, let's get over this. But I go in and after I'm finished, I'm up washing my hands and this woman comes in. And, you know, she's an older woman and she's, you know, she's got a purse. She walked in. This is how she walked in. <laughs> and then two more women came in. She must have gone out and they come in and they do this look. And I'm like, what? And then they just did this. I also I'm gonna open up my shirt and show you my dress. <laughs> because you know it's the craziness. Like years ago, I got a shirt and it says, I know which bathroom I belong in. <laughs> and I used to wear my own shopping gorgeous. <laughs> it was the worst. If I went to the bathroom, oh my God, like, I remember being in a stall and somebody knocking, Sir, sir, do you know where you are? And I'd be like, There's no sir in here. And yes, I do. And the bathroom police. And we still see that. We see that going on with our transgender brothers and sisters and many of them, everyone. It's ridiculous. And yet it still happens. In fact, that's used oftentimes as the biggest argument. And it's something from which people, like, well, what's with you? Are you transgender? So my kids, whenever they're at school, I always tell the teachers, my name is Sue. My kids call me Da, because we weren't real creative. You know, there's their mom and Da, but I'm not transgender. But not there's anything wrong with that. That's an old sign for the But anyway, um, thank you for knowing that. Appreciate people with no history of television. So it's part of that. Like, and I'm not apologizing for it. I, if someone wants to think that I am, that's great. I'll stand up for any right. But it's also the fact that one has to say that if one is a butch present preventing individual, because I really do think that amongst my age group and cohorts, the butch image is dying. I don't meet as many young butches. I don't know about a lot of young butches. Um, I wonder if I was born today and uh, going through some of those same aspects of self awareness, would I be thinking I was transgender? I'll be honest. I mean, I, I love my body. I don't, I don't, what we know to be the determinants of how one uh, feels about their body, about themselves, about being born or named as your body in the wrong number. That was anything that I went through. But I wonder, I wonder if, if that may be part of things. Because I've seen some young individuals who may be more butches, you know, more, more um, involved in their masculine sense of identity who are still women. And people say, oh, but, you know, maybe you're trans. Well, that's up for a person to figure out for themselves. That's a whole self gender and sexuality and being identity. But anyway, I got this. I am butch, I'll be butch till I die. And I was butch when I was born. It's true. From the moment, I mean, I just was me. 
And it was interesting when I was about 40, I met my birth mother. Oh, the book will come out someday. <laughs> <laughs> and when I met her, it was, it's an amazing story about that as well. But in meeting her and learning a little bit about how I came to be in this world and learning about uh, just that she had been raped and looking at the, you know, she grew up in a very, very small town. And uh, after she came back, when she found out she was pregnant, they told her that she had cancer and they were sending her to Buffalo to die. And she stayed in a little house that doesn't exist anymore. It was right near where Buff General now is, that whole medical campus, that area. And after she gave birth, because it wasn't until she got up here that they sort of explained everything to her. In fact, I'm sure she didn't even understand what happened to her when she was raped. She was sent back home. I told nobody to talk about it. And she never did. Until I showed up. Well, actually, it was a whole long story of how I got to it. Yeah, buy the book someday. Um, and in meeting her, I found out that it was a lesbian. Of course, But she wasn't an out lesbian. She was a woman who went back. She married this man because you're supposed to marry, you know, back in the 50s. You know, and that didn't really work out. But she did have a child and a half sister. And she just went on her merry way. Worked at a diner. Oh, I'll, I'll give you a teaser for the book. So for years, I would drive down to Skinny Atlas and to um, Cortland and Ithaca, and I would always cut through in Auburn. And there was this amazing little diner. So I'd stop, I'd put gas in the car, I got these things called Drake's Cakes that had other Scotch frosting for the diner store. And um, I would stop sometimes over at the diner. So if I'd gone after work and I was hungry, the best meatloaf in the world. Oh my God. I, I would talk about this all the time this damn meatloaf. Yes, who was making the meatloaf? Mm -hmm. oh. True, it was my birth mother. She worked there. She was the cook. I know, awesome. <laughs> so it was great to meet her. I got to know. I would only know her for two years, and sadly, she would uh, die from complications of a really hard life, and from lung disease and diabetes and a whole lot of stuff. But it was awesome to know her and to be able. It wasn't so much about me. It was about her. She needed somebody to meet her and say, "I forgive you. I, I love you. I don't hate you." And thank you for giving me a life. And I had a great life. In fact, when I went to meet her, my adopted mother, and I usually don't use those terms, but it's just how you all understand. She made a um, photo album starting from my birth. Because my parents only had pictures of them from when I was three months old when they brought me home from the orphanage, just to give to this woman so that she would know what my life was. And I thought that was the most loving act I have ever known a human being to do, to have that much love to give and say that. You know, just cool. And when Charlotte died, she had two things a bathrobe that I'd given her. And that album over her in the hospital and she was in the castle. Read the book. Anyway, um, <laughs> because, because it's interesting. Because through all of this, here was this butch woman living in this existence, trying to figure out herself. And there's all these people around you. And that's true of everybody, no matter who you are. Like my mother would always say, Oh my God, what are people going to think of me? And I kept thinking, Who cares about you? It's about me. But now that I'm a parent, I get it. It's like things reflect and it goes. And so the more that there's honesty and compassion and connection, it's going to make, at least in that family, and it can come back. My mother, being Irish, I was pronounced dead a couple of times, you know, like, you are dead to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was always a big one. And yet, it still came back around. I don't know, I, I would push it. I'm like, you know, you're going to still show up. And, and it was great. And when my mother was older and she had Alzheimer's as well, um, it was me. And again, with my siblings, but also my kids. She always would say they were her favorites. I just don't love hearing that. Mm -hmm. They're 13 or 14 of her of her um, grandchildren. And they would go to the nursing home with me and they would care and they were there. And it just to have that legacy and to have them be able to be a part of that and to be included and to know that love. I think that's the most special thing. But today, here I am, what you woman, Reverend Dr. Susan Fall. I'm very mm -hmm. proud of that because I never would have thought that a long time ago. And I am a minister, I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister. I have a congregation out in Hamburg. And I also do a lot of work in our area. I also work as a chaplain. I've been an educator. I worked for Bliss for a while. I did a lot of the parent and community outreach until they decided to get rid of their funding for that. But that was my benefit because now I work for the Center for Elder Law and Justice. And I do a lot of work under the Department of Justice grant, focusing on elders in Niagara County, working with the judicial, law enforcement, medical and social. And there's a contingent part of that where we are focusing on LGBTQ issues. Because surprise, surprise, as costs get up higher, there's a large number of individuals who are moving to Niagara County. It's a third of the cost, but they're not the same supports. But recognizing that and working within my law firm and also with other agencies, we're trying to help that and also raise that up. And what else is needed? And how can we make sure that everyone has a life that's safe and supported? 
that brings you up to today. Questions? <laughs> so yeah, I, did, I have a couple questions, but I want to open this up to anyone who is just kind of taking all of this in. Thank you so much for sharing everything that we did. That was really, really lovely. But I know that people are curious in here, and it was, we usually have some good question askers. And um, you know, Sue is really, really frank and forthright about answering and responding to things, and we'll let you know if she doesn't want to respond to anything. So feel free to ask questions, and I and I can certainly fill in any gaps if you don't. Yeah. So thank you, first of all, for speaking with us. Um, also, so in the beginning, you said you were uh, like when you were birth mother, did you have adoption you ever with less than months? I was. I thought it was very interesting because I can imagine that's not accepted in this time frame. And your parents didn't have to like, why would they? Well, nobody knew that. I mean, back then. So, <laughs> um, I was there was a convent in Elma, which is right outside of West Seneca. And that convent was eventually destroyed. It became a Muslim boys' school. Now it's the Department of East Aurora's Highway Department. <laughs> but it was a special little convent, and it was a special group of nuns. And all they did was care for the babies who, before they were going to be. So the babies were already designated through Catholic charities to be adopted. They were just caring for them because back then you didn't just go into a family. I had to do this full time thing. So my parents knew that they, sort of when I was born or when I was put there, that they were going to be adopted. But they couldn't take me until I was three to four months old. So later on in life, when I did some research about the different areas and I researched that particular group, I found out that a lot of the nuns who were in that particular were like these very toxic things, mm -hmm. the lesbian secrets, but they were. And, and being there sort of helped that maternal component that they were they would never be able to have. They loved those babies, my mother would tell me. It was the best place. When you hear the bad things about orphanages, I couldn't have been in a better place. Mm -hmm. Unconditional love from the moment. And I think that that's an important thing too. It's always sort of been like an umbrella in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and nobody talks about that. Well, okay. mm -hmm. And I actually I have three aunts who are nuns. So my mother had three sisters, they all became nuns. My father would say he was the favorite son-in-law, <laughs> um, but I got to travel with quite a few of them, spent a lot of time in convents, and there's a lot of stories, in there. that's a whole other class sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and again, now it's, there's there's still nuns, in fact, the Sisters of Mercy just did a, um, like a caucus, and in it they were talking about diversity, and they were naming aspects of LGBTQ+, and how to do ministry, and connection, and acceptance, and I thought that was huge. And I read the paper and I just, I was so happy to read it. I'm like, this is awesome. Of course, the Pope doesn't really like it and a lot of the bishops don't like it. But I think it's it's positive. When my one aunt passed away and I took um, my children and my aunt, Natalie, we went to the convent for a funeral. The nuns loved us and they still do. My son goes there and does tech work for the nuns as well. They were the most, um, I don't know, inclusive and, and loving people. So anyway, I did not. More questions? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have one. Like, what would you say for like what role religion plays in your life now? And like, it plays a big one. But here's the interesting part: I'm actually an atheist. <laughs> so spirituality isn't always necessarily about faith. And even if you're an atheist, you can still have a connection to the world about social justice. And in Unitarian Universalist faith, there's a space and place for that. And so for me, religion does play a large part, especially in the sense that I used to laugh when I was a chaplain. I used to say, I can pray in any language. You know, having been raised Irish Catholic, my children are Jewish. And when you're Unitarian, you study all different religions. Like if I was Lutheran, I'd go to a Lutheran seminary and I'd study all about the you know, different Lutheran religions. But for not, I had to. So I think for me, it helps me to have a good understanding about people and their roots. I can be um, very patient. I can be very present. Um, my daily faith components kind of are more general about the world and about people. But I can also have some strong sidelines too. Um, but I think that everybody has to figure out what works for them. Um, growing up Catholic, I tried and tried. It just wasn't the place that was going to fit for me. Although I still would take my mom and I love my aunts and I actually still would go to some Catholic things with family. But that wasn't the place. And a lot of other things weren't the place either. Um, but sometimes faith is about community. And so if you find a community that embraces your whole self and it feels good, then that's okay. As long as you're not doing any harm to anyone. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So we were reading the other day that um, in terms of the Butch Foundation, there were not a lot of um, Butch and Butch relationships, but then the relationships because that was a difficult thing. Um, do you see that a lot? 
Yeah, um, it's interesting. Not as much what you, but you have in fact. So, it, and some of those terms can get kind of bagging as well. Even the understanding of that. My my definition understanding. Um, a butch individual is a woman, and, and a woman. That's the most important. Right? So it kind of takes the whole transgender component out. They're just in touch with their masculine sense of beauty, but they don't give up their being a woman part. And a femme can be a feminine presented woman. But there's a whole other aspect of energy. It's kind of a yin yang. Um, it's a dance um, in a true butch and feminine connection. But there's people who dress in a butchy way or a feminine way, which is different. It's not the same energy, it's not the same dynamic. I have rarely seen a lot of butch and butch, although I've the province counter seen more, interestingly enough. But it's not as common and it's usually older. Um, and the feminine, fem, I mean, I, I see a lot of feminine and, and feminine women together. I don't know that it's necessarily femme, femme dynamic per se. Um, and I guess you wouldn't know unless you personally were asking or someone was uh, comfortable enough in sharing that. But yeah, back a long time ago, and even in the Bicon too, though, people didn't like the butches. You know, everything was about, like, even so back when it was the want ads, that's how you people sometimes. Oh, yes, you know, uh, women seeking women, you know, not into butches. It's other people's story, those things. In some of the, uh, you know, dating, you know, not into butches. Well, good for you, because <laughs> a butch probably wouldn't be into you either. <laughs> <laughs> and even the understanding of what a butch is or who a butch would be. And sometimes it's about um, thinking that a butch is a more menial, job looking person, dresses in a, you know, he's got motorcycle boots and dungarees and, you know, a big chain with their keys. And I think, yes, that could be someone, but it could also be me. I like to have a gap of <laughs> May I elaborate on Diane's question for a second? So the question is, though, in the community that you were in, did you feel like you were part of a butch femme community or were you just a butch that was part of the LGBT community? And then the other part of the question I think is, were people critical if people were crossing gender lines and not being in butch femme relationships, but being in more blurry relationships? Yeah, when I first came out, that, it was, that wasn't as defined. So I didn't see, I just saw myself being a gay woman, you know, and it was really more, um, like I said, dressing preppy, jacky, whatever. Um, later, I didn't, that's when I really became more aware and there's also more of a pushback. You know, femmes can kind of stop one way and almost thinking twice. But if you're really being extra butchy, some people had a pushback. Some people didn't. Luckily, they were femmes. It was a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, did I answer that quick? Well, part? was there pushback from butch and femmes for people who were not adhering to that? No. Band? Oh, no, no. There really was an acceptance of everybody for where they came from. Men, on the other hand, gay men, they did not like butches. I see mm -hmm. friends I had from high school and college. That are just like, you know, you just wear some earrings or maybe grow your hair a little longer. I'm like, oh, maybe that would work for you too, bucko. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that same. It's almost like those heteronormative images. And it's important too that in a butch femme dynamic, it's not really the same as a heteronormative. It's not playing those kinds of roles. It's about a different spiritual energy kind of role. Okay, yeah. And we didn't get to talk more about that butch from that was going to be the, the thing, but that's okay. If, if anyone has a couple questions that you want to say after and talk, to Dr. Reverend Sue Frawley, please do. Let's again give her our thanks for being here and sharing this. And um, we are just as a word for teacher mode here. Um, Friday, we're going to be watching that film before we don't have any more time to. We only have until the 20 seconds. So please show up. It's going to be um, about the lesbian um, history archives in Sweden. Okay. So I'll see you all. Then. <laughs> uh, um, it's going to be called Charlotte's Gift of Adoption Story. Mm -hmm. I feel like you should bring the gay element in though and be like a gay, oh, gay adoption good. story or something, you know, like yeah. it's a seller because if you just do that title, you're not maybe I'll have showing your audience. audience. <laughs> <laughs> have a good day. Have a gay day. <laughs> 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 I may be. Are you planning to I come? I think so. My friend actually texted yeah. me about it. So I think we're both going to be together. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Find me there. It just depends on oh, what happens yeah, yeah. with that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Did you know? Did you hear about it from the other store? Um, so my friend posted it on there. It was Samsung. Imagine it was like, oh, that's cool. Like I didn't know about it. Oh, he's more lame. So he's very lame. 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 He
I don't know if he knows everyone that he's a psychology major. Okay. Um, Adelia. Yeah. So I'm sure that's kind of how he knows. So thank you. I don't have spirit It's my time. Ethan. All right. Well, have fun today if I don't see you and let me know how it goes. Bye. Bye. Sometimes and sometimes also you gotta work work to take care of. So but but never get rid of your job do don't think oh I'm just there's always something coming out of it that takes you somewhere else. You never know. Yeah. Um did you feel like you would like so that means the training is actually you would go for a master's or something like that. Do you think it was your thing? Absolutely. You got your doctorate, right? So that's like I have six degrees. Something I think will waste. Yeah. But it was every time I wanted to do something, I did a degree to help push me forward. So I had a bachelor's degree and then I needed a master's. Then I also needed, I um, wanted to do school um, supervision. So I got that. I was down with that. Then I got, um, um, then I got my um, uh, master's of uh, divinity in the and then I also at the same time got as a doctor of ministry. Which really, it isn't academic, but it's not as the same as a like PhD in English. But sometimes you have to have a lot of degrees and sometimes you spend all sorts of experiences in life. And in this day and age, a lot of times people don't want to do degrees. But degrees can also be because there's a lot more on accessibility. Probably, I mean, to be honest, when we're going to do counseling, education, or to be that type of master's degree. It's where to find a place that will be jobs and outcomes. What what are you thinking about in terms of your field? Um, like, I don't know. You no, know, I mean like what are your interests that you want to do? Well, I don't have any interests. Like I don't I just I like learning new things. <laughs> so you know, I'm just like I'm a diverse education oh. thing. Yeah. What are you studying right now? Like my major is like business administration. Oh, wow. I don't know what to talk to. Okay. So, no. One of the biggest areas that's growing, we don't have to talk about anything, is not being on the about this diversity, equity, and inclusion. Companies are looking for people who have education background and experience background, who have trainings to both employees as well as people who do business with. And it's growing that. So, talk with your business advisor. And the focus what you're doing for me, so I see is there a way that you can combine and do that? Trust me. Are you going to do yes, I I'm just going to go to the thing today. Yeah, oh my gosh, I'm so happy because they're actually going. This is so great. Okay. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, talk to some of the people that you meet there in the department. I mean, obviously, I'm friends of the department. I'm a graduate student, um, so I'm not one of the professors, but um, Tell them about your interests because I was going to say, like, if, if you do the business administration, if you do kind of keep following that path, the gender studies goes very well with that field, and it will make you different than the other people that are in your field that you might be, you know, kind of competing with. Well, you know, I'm not a big fan of history, but I like my history. That's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, you can tell me this. Even like working at coming to the sun, even though I know you can't do one seat. I'm big on seats. Like, but today I was like, you know what? Let me maximize sleep and wake up at 9 45 instead of 9. All right. Because it's 9 a.m., 9 is what we really should be done. But, uh, yeah. I'm going at 11. Is that far away from 9? Someone takes you to get here. It's part of the season. It's part of the season. It's part of the season. It's the part of the season. Yeah, right. Not. I don't want to go past the way. So the snow comes. It's the main bar snow moves. Yeah. Aw, Zinni, thank you so much for saying the dog. And let me know how it goes to the open house. And if you want to talk me further. And also, you're in this class. If you, you know, when you go to think about masters, like all these other things that will write your recommendation letter, and even even your presentation you gave in this class was awesome. It was heartfelt, but it was also super, you know, analytic. It's great. Keep going. Very proud of that. They ask you this: What is your goal in the business counseling? Because you do the kind of dedicated program, supposedly, because one of the biggest programs right now is the Cornell. 
but other universities in the school system are looking to do. So just ask for about saying this person, we're talking about the DDR certification on their What are you doing with that? What are you coming up? How many get involved in that? I wonder if the gender study program could start doing something with that and okay. offering it and doing that. So, anyway, in ask for places, and there aren't a lot of universities that are doing that. It's the closest to what's going on right now. Um, did I apply for that? I can't remember. I think I'll apply for the I don't think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about reason. Josh Allen couldn't get into any colleges to be a quarterback. He had to. Bad places to take them and fight them the right over the people he's sitting. Fun to not fight for your place to be. Also, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't think of a better rep, but anyway, you know, I've kind of been here, so yeah, I know. I know. Where are you from? I'm from the city. New York. So, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, there you go. So, basketball is yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Go to the lab. See you on Friday tonight. Bye. I'm gonna record it. Somebody coming in here? Uh, they may be, but we're gonna. Oh, Antonia, Antonia, did you want to say anything? I'm just gonna shut this down. Okay. I don't know if I it's actually it. there. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Are they here? No, I don't think oh. so. I'm just going to shut it down. Mm -hmm. So then